and these are in listen only mode. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Um, this is the April 22nd webinar of the Underservice Workgroup of the Connecticut Medical Assistance Program Oversight Council. I am Ellen Andrews, co chair of the workgroup, a member of the MAPOC and executive director of the Connecticut Health Policy Project. We're fortunate today to have two physicians with us for the webinar. Doctors Hines and Nasser are from Crystal Run Healthcare, and they cover the mid Hudson Valley and lower Catskill region of New York, so very close to Connecticut. Crystal Run is a multi-specialty group practice with over 300 physicians practicing in over 40 specialties. Crystal Run is accredited by the NCQA as both a level three patient-centered medical home and one of six NCQA early adopters to meet their accountable care organization standards. Crystal Run was chosen as one of the first 27 ACOs to participate in Medicare's shared savings program. And as the people listening know, Connecticut policymakers, both in Medicaid and across the state's healthcare system, are exploring shared savings payment models to improve the value of care. Crystal Run offers integrated, coordinated care for all their patients. As we'll hear, they have achieved impressive results in improving care, improving health status, while reducing visits and controlling costs, which allows them to care for more people. So we're very lucky to have Dr. Nasser and Dr. Hines with us to tell us how they do it. Dr. Jonathan Nasser is a practicing internist and pediatrician, medical director, and one of Crystal Run's two clinical transformation officers. The other clinical transformation officer is Dr. Scott Hines, who's also with us. He's a practicing endocrinologist and also medical director for the medical specialties. Uh, some housekeeping about the webinar. If you're listening on the phone, remember to input the audio pin that should be visible on your screen on your phone if you wanna be able to talk and ask questions. We'll be keeping everyone on mute until the speakers are finished, and then we'll have some time for questions. To ask a question, you can raise your hand by clicking that button. It looks like a little up hand, or you can type your questions into the text box on your screen at any point in the video, in the webinar. A video of this webinar will be posted online soon. Thank you, Drs. Nasser and Hines. Hi, uh, uh, this is Dr. John Nasser. I'm going to start off the presentation today, and thank you, Ellen, for that introduction, um, and also for the opportunity to speak with, with all of you today. Uh, I've had a couple of conversations with Ellen previously, and it sounds like you're doing some great things uh, just across the border in Connecticut, and uh, uh, we certainly love the opportunity to collaborate with other groups. A lot of the work that we're doing here at Crystal Run has come through collaborations such as this. So thank you again for the opportunity to present today. And the talk today that we're going to present is entitled, um, you can see on the slide, we're going to talk about our variation reduction program here at Crystal Run and uh, walk you through our process of improving quality and reducing variation, uh, which has led to a number of desired outcomes in our accountable care organization. As Ellen mentioned, Dr. Hines and I are the chief clinical transformation officers here. I noticed that there was a, uh, a photo of us uh, included on the slides today. Uh, which just uh, suggests that one of the important things about reducing variation is to have similar appearing leaders. Um, we require the same haircut for our clinical transformation officers, um, and so I think you'll appreciate that on the slide. Uh, but thank you again for the opportunity. So here's some learning objectives that we will go through today. Uh, again, this is I'm Dr. Nasser. I'm going to start off the presentation and about halfway through turn things over to Dr. Hines. Um, so the learning objectives you can see. Uh, we're going to outline and, and hopefully give you an understanding of the process of variation reduction. Uh, also to understand how this process can both reduce cost and improve access without reducing quality. Uh, we'll show some examples of opportunities for also uh, identifying and improving utilization of care for uh, certain patients. And then finally, understanding how variation reduction can engage providers and specialists as we all transition from our fee-for-service model to one of value. So uh, Ellen did introduce us, uh, just some brief uh, uh, things about Crystal Run, which, which she didn't, uh, I'll kind of highlight the things that I think are important to know in terms of background. We are a physician-owned multi-specialty practice. Um, we're not affiliated with any healthcare systems or hospitals. Um, we are 300 providers, and as she mentioned, we're just across the border in the lower Hudson Valley of New York State. Um, we offer a lot of services to our patients on site. You can see them listed there. We have an ASC, we have an urgent care center, we have our own radiology and labs. Our model includes providing comprehensive outpatient services 
to our patients, and we cover the full spectrum of most uh, specialties. We've been using electronic health records since 1999. We're all on the same health record, which is NextGen. And as Ellen pointed out, we have a number of external validations and accreditations about the work that we're doing here with respect to uh, both joint commission and uh, patient-centered medical home. With respect to our accountable care organization, just to highlight a few things, again, we're a single entity accountable care organization. We have no external partners such as hospitals, and we're all, all of our providers are included in our accountable care organization. There certainly are some strategic um, benefits of that, including the fact that we're all in the same health record. Um, as was mentioned, we are one of the first 27 Medicare Shared Savings Program participants. We have about 10,000 patients under our care in that program, and 82% of the primary care services occur here at Crystal Run. Now, CMS measures primary care services as just any outpatient service with a, with a provider. So it's not visits with primary care physicians, but out, outpatient care, essentially. The average Medicare Shared Savings participant has a primary care service level of about 69%. So we have significant less leakage in our uh, healthcare organization than others. As was mentioned, we also have achieved accreditation through the NCQA. And in 2013, we started to um, align and gather uh, accountable care arrangements with, with commercial payers, uh, including one managed Medicaid provider, which we currently have an accountable care a relationship and contract with. Um, one of our strategies, just to point out for this group, is that we really try to treat all of our patients the same. Um, and our journey from uh, fee for service to value has included um, working with our payers to get as many contracts as possible in a uh, value based care arrangement or an accountable care arrangement because we would prefer and we have always treated all of our patients the same no matter what their payer is. The work that I'm going to present today is really um, things that we've been doing with all of our patients regardless of payer. And we do have a, a fairly sizable managed Medicaid population in our practice, about 20% of our adult uh, population and, and up to upwards of 30% of our pediatric population. So I, hopefully you'll find the information today to be useful no matter what uh, patient demographic you may be serving. Um, here's a few quotes about variation. Certainly variation in some things is interesting and makes life more interesting. I won't read through all of the quotes here, um, but I think that we'll all recognize that uh, variation in life is certainly something that provides interest and spice in terms of the things that we do. But in healthcare, I think we also have all recognized and are aware of the fact that variation is not such a good thing. This has been shown in a variety of different ways. Um, here's a statistic from Dartmouth that nearly 30% of healthcare spending is due to unnecessary or wasteful care. Another statistic that I have heard is that 70% of variation in clinical care is for unexplained reasons, not due to patient demographics or, or severity of illness. Um, there has been some legislative interest in reducing variation as an opportunity of bending the cost curve. And the American Hospital Association also convened a task force on variation in healthcare spending um, as an opportunity for improving quality and reducing costs. It is certainly true that there is some variation in care that is appropriate. Again, as I mentioned, some of that has to do with patient factors, but it is estimated that 70% of variation is not explained by these things. What we found is that most variation is inappropriate and is really due to failure to adhere to best practice guidelines and best practice standards. Um, the American Hospital Association and their task force found that a lot of the reduction or most of the variation uh, reduction was under the control of providers and hospitals. Um, so we've utilized and have recognized that reducing variation is an opportunity to impact both cost and quality. And I think we're all aware that the airline industry has been the model for reducing variation as an opportunity of improving safety. And you'll see some examples where we've identified reductions in variations to address all of those things. So what are we doing about it here at Krista Run? We're going to walk you through what we've been doing now probably over the last three years as we've, as, we, as we've implemented this variation reduction program. And what we've learned and what we'll share today is that reducing variation maintains or improves quality, reduces cost, and improves access. The purpose of this program here was not to reduce costs, 
but usually it is a byproduct of improving quality, and that's something that we'll outline as we move through the slides today. So I'm going to start off the presentation today going through our pilot. This was something that we started back in 2010. Um, we'll then talk about how we took the pilot and spread it elsewhere uh, through the variety of divisions in our organization, and that was a journey through 2011 to 2012. Um, version 2.0 was that we created an internal automated tool with our business intelligence team and we started to have quarterly meetings with all of our providers to bring the tool to them and have some real-time point of care uh, analysis of variation. That was through 2012 and, and to the end of last year. And version 3.0 is that we've updated and have uh, adapted our tool. We're about to start using that with our providers in 2014. So we'll walk you through this journey. This process over the last uh, now four years has really involved um, uh, pilot tweaking, uh, getting feedback from our providers, engaging them in discussion, figuring out what more information was needed, and applying that as we move forward. And again, we've utilized this in a variety of ways, but not the least of which is to engage our providers in the transition to value. Uh, let's see, I'm not advancing for some reason. I seem to have lost the ability to advance. I don't know if, Ellen, you might be able to advance for me. There we go. Great, thanks. So variation reduction, the definition. This is a cost control measure which seeks to standardize care according to clinical guidelines and eliminates waste amongst those not adhering to national or local practice standards. Next slide. So the key things here, though, to focus on are standardizing care and eliminating waste. And again, we'll walk through that process with you. But that's kind of our take home message about this process and how to implement, that, uh, implement it in our own organization. Next slide. So in terms of the process, the first process, step one, is to analyze utilization. Um, when we started this process, we did not have claims data. And you'll see in a second that we used charges per patient as our surrogate for utilization of resources with respect to diagnoses. The next step is to compare utilization between physicians and to compare that in a transparent fashion. And then step three is to analyze the variation. Next slide. So the first step, uh, analyzing utilization. Again, we started out looking at diabetes in our pilot. Um, and as I mentioned, back in 2010 when we started this, without having claims data, we utilized the total cost for diabetes per, per, uh, per physician, and we measured it by looking at our internal charges. It's not a perfect measure of total cost. We did not have external costs such as hospitalization, but we utilized the charges per patient as our surrogate for cost to at least begin a conversation with our providers around uh, variations in care. We included and broke down the data uh, specifically to look at professional charges, lab charges, imaging, and procedures. Next slide. So after analyzing the utilization, our next step was to compare utilization between the physicians. Go ahead and to the next slide. So here's the graph that we produced when we first started our pilot. On this graph, on the y-axis is charges per patient per year. On the x-axis is the providers. The red is professional charges, blue is lab charges, and there's a tiny sliver of radiology charges in yellow. Again, this was tied to the uh, diagnosis of diabetes. The radiology charges we felt were most likely due to inappropriate um, ordering of a diagnostic test with the diagnosis of diabetes. So there wasn't a lot of charges there for that. When we met with our, I'll oh, go back one slide. So when we met with our providers, we had this uh, available to them. Their names were actually on this graph. We found that transparent data sharing is a very powerful way to engage in conversation and impact change. So although we've not included the names on this graph for the purpose of this presentation, when the providers had this available to them, they could see where they compared to their colleagues. Now go ahead to the next slide. So the next part after sharing this data was to ask the providers, you know, what is the source of variation? Why do we have a, a, a quite, quite a variety, as you saw in that graph, in charges per patient 
between all of our primary care physicians, and it also included our endocrinologists in this model. Now, before asking this question, we certainly wanted to, you can go to the next slide. Before asking this question, we certainly were prepared with one of the answers. And if any time you ask a provider, uh, you know, why, why they may cost more than their colleagues, one of the first responses typically is that my patients are sicker. So we were prepared with that. Uh, we, we suspected that that would be an answer. And when we went to that first meeting, we had some data to share with them to refute that notion. So go ahead to the next slide. Now, this is a primitive way of looking at um, uh, sort of uh, risk and in terms of looking at risk adjustment. But what we did for this analysis was we broke down our providers, again, this is primary care physicians, um, to, uh, we broke down the patients uh, for each provider based on the number of diagnoses that were assessed at each visit. So the group far to the left is an average number of assessments of four or more. The group in the middle is three to four uh, average diagnoses per visit, and the group to the right is one to two. So essentially we broke the providers into the average number of assessments that they were seeing, and we use this as a primitive measure of uh, risk of the patient panel. When we broke that down though, um, what we saw was that within each group, within each risk group, so to speak, there was the same variation. There were high cost providers and there were low cost providers. And so in showing this data to them, our conclusion and the providers agreed that the illness or the severity of illness of the patient was not the driver of cost. Go ahead to the next slide. So the next thing that the providers, we expected them to say and they did say was, well, I may cost more than my colleague, but my quality is better. So again, we expected that and we came to that first meeting with the next graph. Go ahead to the next slide. This was a graph where we broke down each provider. We broke down their charges per patient and then we superimposed on that A1C control. And again, what you can see here is that the high cost providers and the low cost providers had variations in A1C control that were not related to the charges. There was no correlation between quality as measured by percent of diabetics with an A1C less than seven and the charges that were needed to achieve that. Go ahead to the next slide. So finally, after refuting those two concerns, what we really boil things down to is our best practice guidelines being followed. Go ahead to the next slide. Now, fortunately for diabetes, diabetes is a challenging thing to, to tackle because it is such a diverse um, and uh, complex disorder, but there's an excellent guideline from the American Diabetes Association which comes out yearly. So we had a really great source as a reference to look at what the best practice standard was and what the evidence suggested as what should be done for each patient. Having that to fall back on, what we learned in talking with our providers, looking at the guidelines, was that the variation in charges really had more to do with frequency of lab visits. How often we were seeing patients that had diabetes for labs was a key driver of charges. Also frequency of office visits. Now fortunately, the American Diabetes Association actually suggests that for patients who are well controlled with diabetes, they do not need to be seen every three months and to have labs checked every three months and have us tell them that their A1C is well controlled. We had a lot of providers who were doing that in talking about the guideline and looking at the best care for those diabetic patients. We recognized that seeing them every six months was appropriate for some patients who were well controlled. We also learned that some of the variation had to do with accuracy of coding. And that's something that we worked on separately and not something specifically that came in, came in with the guideline, but something that we talked with our physicians about. Frequency and use of consultants was another thing that we learned was driving some of the variation. And again, the American Diabetes Association had some recommendations about when an endocrinologist should be involved. And then finally, we did have a conversation about medications. Medication certainly is a driver of cost, but based on our analysis looking at internal charges, we did not have that information available to share with providers. Nonetheless, we did agree upon and looked at some uh, best practices around which medication should be used in what scenarios. Next slide. So that was our pilot. We took that analysis from the third quarter and fourth quarter of 2010 and compared it with the third and fourth quarter of 2000, uh, 2011 to see what difference things made. And go ahead to the next slide. And what we learned over that period of time was that um, we had a dramatic reduction in charges per patient in a variety of ways. Overall, our total charges per patient were reduced by 9% during that brief pilot. And within each category, we saw charges per patient as far as professional charges go down by 7%, lab charges by 15%, and 
And radiology charges actually reduced as well, but again, we really thought that this was not reflective of the care that was given, but more in terms of accurate uh, ordering of testing. Now we'll share with you in a moment, um, go back one slide for me, we'll share with you in a moment, our quality did not go down. You know, I know there's obviously, there may be some concern that reducing charges led to inferior care, but you'll see later on in the talk that our quality has actually been maintained or improved as we've made this intervention. Go ahead to the next slide. This is a graph that shows, us, uh, that shows the change in variation between 2010 and 2012 for primary care in terms of diabetes. This, uh, this is all uh, of our providers. Again, on the y-axis is charges per patient. On the x-axis is the providers. And you can see here that uh, the, uh, both the mean, the mean went down by about $70 per patient, and the coefficient of variation, although I don't have it listed here, were reduced. Essentially, we tightened the variation in care, and we reduced our mean charges per patient over this time between 2010 and 2012. Next slide. This is looking at the slide in a different way. This is each individual physician between 2010 and 2012 and their charges per patient. And what you can see here is that most providers did decrease their charges per patient. But interestingly, there were a group of providers over to the right who were the lower cost providers who increased their charges. This would suggest to me that this group, there were groups of providers in the lower cost area who actually learned through implementation of best practices that they weren't providing enough care for diabetics. And we saw in this group that there were some increases in charges uh, related to that change that uh, 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 happened. Go ahead to the next slide. So, at the end of the day, uh, we really felt that the pilot was impactful and had a profound impact on diabetes. And as you can see here in this slide, we felt that this was an opportunity for us to apply this to a, a larger group of, of patients and physicians in the practice. So I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Hines to um, uh, go through the rest of the talk today about the pilot and the spread of this throughout our organization. All right, great. So. Um... So if you can go on to the next uh, slide, or let's see, um, am I going to can uh, here try to try to give me the control and I'll see if I can um, advance it. doesn't look like uh... Dr. Hines you should have control now okay um... hmm doesn't seem to be letting me advance oh wait let me try this okay there I got it sorry about that all right so um, so when we saw the effect that um, this process had on our pilot diagnosis, we decided that, um, you know, this was something we needed to spread across the organization and explore a little bit more. And so um, once a month, we get all of the clinical division leaders together for our leadership academy, and we devoted two months, um, November and December of 2012, to, um, uh, to, to, to having each division leader lead their own variation reduction project. And so we provided each division leader with the top 10 diagnoses for their specialty. Um, we asked them to choose a diagnosis that lends itself best to developing a best practice guideline. And then our business intelligence folks um, created and provided them with the graphs. And uh, Dr. Nass or myself made ourselves available um, you know, for, the, for the meetings, for any assistance that they may need in leading a discussion. Um, and we asked them to develop a best practice standard for the diagnosis that they chose and then develop some actionable items, you know, two or three actionable items to standardize utilization. And so on this slide, it shows the diagnoses that each um, division chose. So as you can see here, we have a mix of both um, primary care and specialty care, uh, medical specialties and surgical specialties. I'm not gonna read through them all, but, um, but here they are on here. Um, and just to give you a couple of um, glimpses of, um, you know, lessons learned, so, um, for hypertension, um, when we looked at um, um, implementing a best practice guideline and compared um, 2010 to 2012, um, much of the variation that was seen 
was in the realm of uh, follow-up visits. So it was looking at how often are patients being seen in follow-up for either poorly controlled or well-controlled um, hypertension. Um, for um, for um, neurology, looking at um, uh, looking at migraines and headache, much of the variation uh, was reduced by focusing on um, MRI. Um, so this was focusing on what are the um, evidence-based guidelines for obtaining um, MRI uh, for patients who present with headache or migraine. For um, our orthopedists, looking at lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow, um, much of the variation was being driven by procedures that were being performed, and when they standardized, had, a, had kind of a standardized approach to um, uh, less invasive to more invasive procedures and how you kind of work, work through that process, uh, much of the variation was reduced. And what it all summed up to um, when you compared uh, charges per patient in 2010 versus charges per patient in 2012, so calendar year 2010 before the intervention, calendar year 2012 after the intervention, um, what you can see is that in 13 of the 14 pilot diagnoses, there was a significant reduction in charges per patient. Um, so all but one went down, and the grand total came out to about $4.2 million in um, charges, in, in reduction of charges, which was pretty impressive for just 14 diagnoses. So the question that always gets asked, and I think it's an appropriate question that gets asked, is what happens to quality when you implement best practices? And really, you know, as Dr. Nasser mentioned at the beginning, the goal of this, pro uh, the goal of this uh, project was to improve quality by standardizing care. And we feel, and as an organization, our philosophy has been that if we implement best practices, quality will improve, access and patient experience will improve, and the cost reduction will just kind of happen. You know, we don't focus on the cost reduction. We focus on adhering to best practices, and that will eliminate waste from the system. And so what you can see here as far as quality is concerned for diabetic control, so um, on the graph on the left, A1C greater than 9, lower is better here. So the fewer patients you have with an A1C greater than 9, the better. We started out well below the NCQA goal, and we um, ended up well below the NCQA goal. Um, stay with, same with A1Cs less than 7. Here, higher is better. So um, the more patients that have A1Cs um, less than 7, the better. And again, we started out above this goal, and uh, we ended up above this goal. Now, you probably noticed a little bit of a downtick um, between 2012 and 2013. Much of this, though, was in some changes in uh, recommendations. The, the um, strict control of diabetics, particularly those over the age of 65, has been under some question, and so there's been a little bit of a loosening of the, um, of, of the guidelines there. Um, when you look at hypertension control, again, um, we started out um, above the NCQA goal and ended up above the NCQA goal for controlling um, hypertension in both our cardiac patients and in our overall population. And the same with hyperlipidemia, again, in both the cardiac patients and in patients who have um, concomitant hypertension. Um, we started out above the, um, and actually in this one for the cardiac patients, we started out below the NCQA goal, but through the implementation of best practices, um, we exceeded the NCQA goal. And for our patients with um, uh, concomitant hypertension, um, you can see here a clear improvement in our patients at goal for their um, hyperlipidemia since implementing best practices. So based on that, um, you know, I would uh, I would venture to to conclude that um, adhering to best practice guidelines in this process of variation reduction um, helps to improve quality and helps to reduce cost. And we'll touch on the access piece at the end here. Um, but what was really um, uh, interesting for us and something that really um, kind of bolstered the program moving fo forward was how was was its effect in engaging physicians um, when we did these. Um, these division level uh, projects and we charged each division leader with performing a project with their division, uh, what we found is that the docs that were involved were really engaged in, in, in the process. Um, and they were asking a lot of really good questions. So they were asking, you know, where does the variation lie? If you're telling me that, um, you know, the variation is in labs ordered, are the variations in the number of labs that are being ordered or the specific labs that are being ordered or how frequently they're getting labs? 
Um, so that so so those are all great questions. The other question they had is, you know, how can we get this information in real time? Um, you know, when we looked at our first pilot diagnosis, diabetes, as Dr. Nasser went through, it took about three months to get that data. Um, when we to, to, to create the the, the graphs that that um, capture that data. When we did the 14 pilot diagnoses for our um, division leaders, um, those 14 diagnoses took about six weeks to come up with the data. And that's just too much time. We wanted, you know, our docs want, um, you know, access to data instantly. They want to be able to choose the diagnosis and have these graphs spit out um, instantaneously. And then the question was, how can we really leverage this information with our providers? So, um, you know, how can we use this process to really advance our goals of transforming our practice into one that um, uh, that is value-based. And so, um, so again, as I alluded to um, here, the, the uh, you know, one of the main questions was where does the variation lie? Um, so I already mentioned as far as the laboratory and the diagnostics and the procedures, again, was it the number of tests per patient that were being ordered or was it the specific test that was being ordered that was driving the variation? Um, and professional charge is a little um, different of a conversation. It, it, was it the number of visits per patient, where there's some folks who are seeing their diabetics every, you know, three months and some are seeing them every six months? Um, or was it that, um, for our specialists in particular, the types of patients that you were seeing? So was the variation due to the fact that, you know, maybe the newer doctors are seeing more new patients and consults, and so that was driving up their charges, whereas the uh, more established doctors were seeing all follow-ups? Or was it merely a, a, um, a phenomenon of coding? Was it that some docs were coding all their diabetics as level fours and level fives, and some docs coding them all as level twos and level threes? So what we decided to do um, in order to leverage this tool and build on this um, kind of uh, excitement that came out of the division leader project was to charge our business intelligence folks with creating an automated tool. Um, they spent much of 2012 building this automated tool. Um, I think I misspoke before as far as the timeline is concerned. The division leader projects were actually in 2011. I can't believe already that that was uh, two and a half years ago. But um, so that was done at the end of 2011. Much of 2012 was spent um, working with our business intelligence folks to create an automated tool that it would have the ability to analyze the cause of variation and answer those questions that I just went through on the previous slide. Um, our plan then was to carve out time in our provider schedule, so um, a half, uh, one, one hour every quarter with every department that Dr. Nasser and myself would meet with the um, division and perform one of these variation reduction um, projects and use this as um, our, our main tool for physician engagement, beefing up our best, pra best practice guidelines, and then um, looking at how that affects both quality and cost. And so the next, um, so again, um, this, this slide just basically, um, it goes through the same, same sort of process here. Um, so the way that we would have these meetings run is um, the meeting before, um, we would say, okay, well, what diagnosis do you want to look at next time? And so endocrinology would say, well, we want to look at thyroid cancer. So we would ask for a volunteer to research the best practice guidelines for thyroid cancer and bring those to the next meeting. And then when we would show the variation reduction graph at the next meeting, we'd say, okay, well, there looks like there's a huge variation in the labs that are being ordered. Let's take a look at that. Um, and the discussion that ensues where, you, where people say, well, I order thyroglobulins every six months, and I do them every year, and I do them every three months. And you say, well, what do the best practices recommend? And the content expert, the kind of champion for that, um, that, that guideline um, who did the research would be able to answer those questions. And so um, through that process, in a relatively time efficient way, you can come away with two or three takeaways to reduce variation. Um, and then we would spend the last you know, few minutes of the meeting going back and looking at the diagnoses that were done previously and seeing what impact we're having on reducing, um, um, on reducing uh, cost. So the next few slides just gives you a few screenshots of our tool. This is actually our old tool. Um, we were in the process of building a newer tool, which I can talk about a little bit at the end here, but it's much of the same stuff. So, um, so basically, you uh, choose a uh, specialty, um, and then you choose a diagnosis that's linked to that specialty, and then it spits out a graph that looks like this. And so um, I'm just going to go through a couple of examples here. So for, um, for pain management, so for our pain management docs, looking at back pain, 
Um, this is looking at variation in professional charges, and the blue are the professional charges here. So the arrow is pointing to the physician that had the um, highest number of professional charges. And when you drill down to try to figure out why, um, why he has the highest number of charges, the two options are either they're seeing that this physician was seeing the patient more frequently, or maybe this physician was seeing all the new patients in consults, which just, you know, cost more. But what you can see here is that this physician was averaging five visits per year, whereas many of his colleagues were averaging somewhere between one and three visits per year. Um, and it really had nothing to do with the consults, because as you can see where the arrow is pointing here, um, he had relatively few new patients in consults compared to his colleagues, probably because he was seeing all of his follow-ups a little more frequently than they were. So this started a conversation, again, not to call this physician out and say, why are you doing things this way? This started the conversation as to how often should we be seeing our patients with back pain? What are the you know what should we make as our best practice for that? Um, take a similar situation. Um, so this was looking at the diagnosis of diarrhea for a gastroenterologist. Um, the arrow is pointing to the doc that had the highest professional charges for this diagnosis. And here it wasn't the visits per patient because they were relatively tightly aligned, and you can see it was in the bottom half for that. Um, but it was more the fact that uh, this was one of the newer docs and was seeing more of the new, pa new patients and consults. That is the, um, the, the blue chunk on that um, the, the graph on the right. What about lab? So looking at laboratory for our primary care doctors for hyperlipidemia, um, much of the variation for lab was the number of visits per year to the lab. So if you look at the graph on the left, about half of the docs had patients getting labs um, between one and one and a half times a year. The other half of the docs were having patients get labs about two and a half times a year, and it didn't have to do with the um, specific labs that were being ordered. If you look at the graph on the right, the width of the different colored bars is relatively similar throughout all the docs. This really shows that um, the variation was more due to the number of times each year that somebody was getting labs done for this diagnosis. Contrast that with rheumatology looking at joint pain. Um, you know, joint pain is a diagnosis that basically patients get once when they first present uh, for, a, for a consult because um, well, you don't really know what, what the cause is yet. Um, the next visit, you hopefully have an etiology and your, your diagnosis would be rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis or that sort of thing. Um, so here for joint pain, each doc had only one visit um, where they were drawing labs for that diagnosis. But you can see in the graph on the right, there was a huge variation in the amount of labs that were ordered and the types of labs that were ordered. And if um, you drill down even further um, in the tool, you can click on the other, which is the dark purple here. And what you get is the graph on the right on this next slide, which shows the more esoteric tests that were being ordered. And just again, the huge variation <coughs> in those tests. And so this um, you know, led us to have a very um, you know, a good conversation with our rheumatologist as to, you know, what should be the stepwise evidence-based approach to a lab workup of joint pain. Um, looking at radiology, um, again, here going back to our pain management docs and looking at back pain, um, the variation was not in the number of tests per patient. Um, as you can see on the left, the variation was what you see on the right, which is the type of test that's being ordered. So the docs that had the highest spend in, um, in uh, imaging for back pain, it was due to the fact that they were ordering more MRIs and CAT scans than their colleagues. And lastly, looking at the procedural charges for uh, cardiology for the workup of chest pain, um, as you can see on the right there, there's you know, no, uh, uh, no standardization as to what kind of tests get ordered for chest pain. And so um, again, this led to a great you know, conversation with our cardiologist as to what is the stepwise approach to um, working up chest pain. So um, we so we spent um, most of 2013, um, so actually all of 2013, each quarter, starting the first quarter of 2013, um, we met with the various specialties. And here are some of the things that came out of those visits. So for urgent care, um, created a UTI protocol that eliminated unnecessary urine cultures. Um, Menorrhagia for OBGYN, there was one of our OBGYN practices that were using infusion hysterosonography as a first line test and it really wasn't evidence based. And so um, after going through this process, they eliminated doing that. Um, iron deficiency anemia, so a standardized protocol for IV iron infusion. So um, there is one IV iron infusion that is one visit, a um, little more expensive, but only one visit, whereas the other one were multiple visits 
each visit was a little less expensive, but when you put it all together, you could improve access and actually reduce costs with similar quality if you switched over to InFed versus Fearless Vet. And um, it was, you know, until we sat down, we have four um, hematology oncology docs. Until we sat them all down together to talk about this, they were all doing this in a little bit different way, but, you know, they all practiced on the same hall as each other, um, but they just weren't you know, discussing these things. And so having a venue where we can have an open discussion like this is, is invaluable. Um, thyroid cancer and uh, for endocrinology, multiple sclerosis for um, neurology, standardizing surveillance because they're very expensive surveillance tests that are done. And um, up until um, we started doing this process, there was really no standard approach to that. Um, hypercoagulable state. Um, coming up with a best practice guideline that spanned both primary care and hematology. Our hematologists were saying, you know, we get these patients for hypercoagulable workup um, that the primary care doctor already ordered, you know, a bazillion tests. And frankly, we don't need all of those tests. We only need, you know, these two or three things. So, um, you know, had some, you know, we developed the best practice guideline and then spent time, um, you know, educating the, the primary care doctors as far as that's concerned. And I'm not going to read all the rest of it here, but you get a flavor as to, um, you know, some of the different things that are being worked on. So how is this translated to a reduction in cost? Um, so for our, our gastroenterologists, looking at standardizing the approach to abnormal LFTs, we saw a char it, by charges per patient a reduction of 17% when you compared um, 2012 versus 2013. For um, Neurology, looking at multiple sclerosis, again, just by standardizing the surveillance of these expensive lab tests and imaging studies for these patients, the charges per patient were reduced by 14%. And for thyroid cancer, um, for endocrinology, again, very expensive um, you know, surveillance labs and um, imaging, um, just by following best practices and standardizing that, reducing charges per patient by 4%. Um, Again, we mentioned the um, uh, UTI protocol in urgent care. Um, the urgent care um, charges per patient was relatively flat for UTI, but the, um, the lab charges were reduced by 76%. Um, same for hematology looking at anemia. Um, the infusion charges were reduced by 24%. Um, so, so again, I think you can, you can see the utility in um, just getting um, you know, docs together to talk about how they're practicing, how that compares to best practices, two or three takeaways that the group can do to standardize their practice styles and the effect that that can have on both quality and cost. Now let's shift gears a little bit and look at access. And I have to apologize, um, these slides are a little bit older. We actually um, updated this a little bit, um, and I'll point that out as we go through here. But um, you know, to many of our providers, access is more tangible than cost. Um, providers don't tend to think about cost per patient. They don't tend to think about, um, you know, charges per patient. They tend to think more about, um, you know, ha uh, for many of these docs, they tend to think about, well, how can I um, improve my access so that my wait time isn't, you know, six weeks to get a patient in, I can get patients in in a more reasonable time frame. So our assumption was if we followed best practice guidelines, we could eliminate unnecessary visits. And when we say unnecessary visits, what we mean is um, the diabetic who has an A1C of 6.5 on metformin doesn't need to be seen in three months, they need to be seen in six months. Our well-controlled hypertensive patient, you know, doesn't need to be seen in three months, they need to be seen in six months. So these are, you know, adherence to best practice standards can eliminate these unnecessary visits. Um, and we feel that in some specialties, it can help to fix the access problem. Now, the numbers that I have here <clears throat> they were a little bit um, uh, high when we did a little more research. It turns out the average physician um, that I, I was calculating this based on our physicians. Um, our physicians average about 5250 visits per year. We tend to be a highly productive bunch. But when you look nationally, it's about 3,600 visits per year. Um, and so if you say that the average physician sees 3,600 visits per year, keep that in the back of your mind, um, when we when we calculated what happened to visits per patient for the original 14 diagnoses that we chose, on a visit per patient basis, we eliminated nearly 13,000 visits. And how we calculated this was we took the number of visits per patient in 2012, subtracted the number of visits per patient in 2010, and kept the population the same, 
um, we used the baseline population from 2010. We multiplied the difference by the number of patients in that baseline um, population. And these are the numbers that we came up with. So we eliminated 13,000 visits on a visit per patient basis, despite seeing almost 1,800 new patients, distinct patients for these same diagnoses. As a result, again, if you think about 3,600 visits per year, we, cre in essence, created, I have 2.5 here using the old math, but using the new math, about three and a half physicians. So without hiring any additional physicians, we created access equal to three and a half new physicians just by adhering to best practice guidelines. Now, what happens if we extrapolate this across the entire practice? So our thought was, you know, it, are we just affecting the diagnoses that we are looking at in a formal way at these quarterly meetings, or are we changing the culture of care here at Crystal Run? And what we found is um, a sort of a, uh, what we like to call herd immunity, that just by applying the same, um, you know, uh, manner of providing care to all diagnoses across the entire practice, what you see is the visits per patient, the red line going down, um, the distinct patients, the blue line going up, and so the actual visit count going up. So visits per patient going down, distinct patients going up, total visits going up, and in essence, we eliminated 42,000 visits on a visit per patient basis, despite seeing 30,000 new patients, distinct patients, and we created 12 additional physicians. Again, we didn't hire 12 additional physicians. We were able to create the access for 12 additional physicians. So next step, um, so um, again, um, deviating from this a little bit, so when um, we updated the tool over the course of the last two or three months, what we looked to do was create a tool that was even more flexible than the one that I just showed you. Um, what we found for some diagnoses is that the variation was based on what ICD-9 code docs were choosing. So if you took, for example, um, back pain, some docs may be using back pain, some docs may be using spondylitis, uh, some docs may be using sciatica. And so the new tool allows us to specifically choose which ICD-9 codes we want to group under a diagnosis heading so that when we look at variation, the variation is due just to the factors we talked about, professional, lab, imaging, procedure, and not due to the fact that one doc only uses, you know, one ICD-9 code while another doc uses another. So it gives us the flexibility of being able to do that. Um, we do want to, in the future, use claims level data. You know, probably the biggest weakness of this tool is that it does not allow us to look at hospital spend or pharmacy spend. Um, if we had claims level data, we'd be able to do that. We're just now starting to get that data, um, and so we would want to be able to, um, to um, morph the tool to be able to do that in the future. Um, and over the course of the next year, we're aiming to empower our uh, medical directors um, to run these uh, these meetings. We've been doing it for a year now, uh, actually almost a year and a half now. We feel that uh, the medical directors are probably at a point where they can lead these meetings themselves. So how are we doing? Um, you know, on a charges per patient basis, again, um, this slide is a little bit old, but um, what we've seen here is that on charges per patient, um, from 2008 to 2000, you know, mid to late 2010, an increase in charges per patient. This was the fee-for-service world. Um, it was really the end of 2010 that the practice started on this journey toward value, and what you see is a plateau and then an eventual reduction in charges per patient. Um, we have a similar slide um, that was recently produced looking at receipts per patient where the reduction was even more dramatic. And despite charges per patient going down, we are growing the practice, so we have more distinct patients, and so our total charges are going up. And so this is how we have dealt with um, having, you know, what, what they call a foot into each of two canoes, where the majority of our payers are still rewarding us for fee-for-service, so transaction-based um, um, uh, reimbursement, where we're trying to practice value-based reimbursement. And frankly, you know, up until now, Every MRI that we're not, we own the MRI machines. You know, every MRI we're not doing, every knee arthroscopy we're not doing, every, um, you know, visit that we're preventing, we're losing money on that as a medical practice. And the way that we have weathered the storm 
is by growing and by increasing our number of distinct patients and by trying to push our payers as quickly as possible to rewarding us on value. And we've been um, relatively successful with that. Much of 2013 was spent doing that. We now have um, four uh, pay commercial payers in addition to the Medicare Shared Savings Program that are paying us on value, one of which is a managed Medicaid product here in New York State. And we have um, two more that are coming on board in 2014 and two more that are still in discussion. Um, this is our MSSP data. Again, this is a little bit old, but we see a similar reduction in charges per patient for our MSSP population. So in summary, uh, we feel that variation reduction is a powerful tool to in maintain or improve quality, reduce costs, and improve access. Um, providing physicians with real-time um, diagnosis-specific data leads to rapid changes in practicing patterns. And any initiative that addresses quality and cost needs to move from the provider's subconscious to consciousness. So what I mean by that is um, we, need to, we need to just meet regularly, talk about this stuff, um, you know, make it the culture of how you care for patients and not just another exercise that docs perform so they can check off a box and say that they did it. Um, so this is our last slide. Um, so uh, this is a lot of work uh, and when uh, people ask, you know, how do you tackle all this? It's like, you know, how do you eat an elephant? Just one bite at a time. And that's kind of how we, um, uh, you know, how, how we do this. So, um, so at this time, um, we'll stop. And um, I don't know if you want to unmute the line for, for questions or... Um, I think um, or I'll ask to, people uh, to raise their hand. You can click the little raised hand button or you can type it into the question box if you have a question. Um, and I'm going to start. i got to prioritize, though. I've got a lot of questions for you both. Um, that was phenomenal. Thank you. Um, in terms of the best practices, there, you know, you talked about diabetes. There's well-vetted, you know, best practices that have been out there for a long time, and they're really well understood for that condition, but there aren't for others. Can you yeah. talk about... Um, what if you're, and it's, I understand that the division leaders choose the condition. What if they choose one where there aren't good best practices right now? Sure. So, so let me give you two examples. Um, so one example would be where there are multiple best practices. So for osteoporosis, for example, there's uh, recommendations from the National Osteoporosis Foundation, the USPSTF, and from the International Society of Clinical Densitometry. And they have some things that are similar, um, but then they have some points which are, um, which are conflicting in the different guidelines. And so what we do is we get together, um, <clears throat> you know, we get together some internal experts. So for osteoporosis, we took uh, primary care, endocrinology, OBGYN. Uh, we had one or two folks from each of those. And we said, okay, well, where is their agreement? Wherever there's agreement, we should, we should use that. Where there's not agreement, what do we think is kind of the local best practice? So how have people been, um, you know, practicing to date? Uh, what is kind of expected from our patients based on our practicing pattern? And does that correlate with one or two or, or you know, one of these two or three, you know, conflicting guidelines? And so, um, you know, we kind of make a judgment call as to, um, you know, based on kind of um, traditional care, um, you know, which of the, um, you know, two or three conflicting guidelines we should adopt as a group. When it comes to something that may not have best practices at all associated with it, or may just have, um, you know, kind of expert opinion that's out there, um, you know, we basically just rely on the group's expertise to come up with a standard way of doing things. And we look at it as um, what is the evidence for quality? So is there, um, you know, even if there's just a, a paper out there um, looking at, you know, quality versus, uh, you know, one thing versus another. A, a good example would be for rheumatology. Um, um, our rheumatologist was just looking at, you know, data that's out there looking at infusions for rheumatoid arthritis versus triple oral therapy. So there's not like a, um, there's not necessarily a um, well-developed best practice for that, but there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of data lately looking at, you know, triple therapy, you know, triple oral therapy for, um, for rheumatoid arthritis versus infusion, and there's quality data associated with that, equal quality between the two. And so if you have two different approaches that have equal quality, then the next step that the group should look at is, well, what costs less? 
because first, you know, first uh, priority is quality. So, you know, we need to choose the one that has the highest quality. If there's clearly one that's better, we go with that regardless of cost. But if there's two that are equivocal, then we need to look next at which one has the lowest cost. And so that's kind of the approach that we've taken for um, for these things. Okay, um, Margaret Murphy has, thank you very much. Uh, I know we're running out of time. Margaret Murphy from the Center for Medicare Advocacy has a question. And Margaret, I've unmuted your line. You should be able to talk. Sure, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Hello, good. Yep. Uh, so, so Doctor, you know, I mean, it's uh, very interesting, a lot of food for thought, and um, you're doing mostly fee-for-service. And when I'm representing Medicare beneficiaries, I'm often working with episodic payments or capitated payments, for example, in home health. Um, and so, you know, sometimes when people need a lot of care and there's a fixed payment, we run into problems with, um, you know, people not getting all the care they need because heavy care users are more expensive and they eat up more of the a capitated payment, let's call it a capitated payment. Do you have any ideas or suggestions for that kind of shared savings? And, um, you know, how would you approach that? Yeah, I th this is John Nasser. I mean, I, I think, you know, we're heading to that. I mean, we, we view our transition now, we're probably, you know, maybe 15 to 20 percent of our, of our volume of patients are now in some form, not necessarily capitated, but there's some risk associated with it where we're ultimately at the end of the day functioning like a capitated model where we're looking at opportunities of providing the most efficient care possible. Um, one of the things that I think is different about that than maybe in years ago with managed care is the fact that we're still held to the same quality uh, external validation that, that you probably are in this population as well. I think the way that we're transitioning that though is that, um, and, and we're not quite in that, in that area yet, Obviously, if the capitated rate is, is quite low, it becomes quite challenging. I think our view on this is to get from point A of fee-for-service to the end, sort of the end point of capitation, we have been systematically identifying opportunities for uh, improving value by um, uh, devoting the right resources to care. So it doesn't quite answer your question, but outside of the scope of this talk today, we're doing a lot of work for our Medicare patients as an example for the large bucket cost items, the population health management, um, utilizing home health services where appropriate and can be effective, but also reducing readmissions and doing a lot of the same work that you guys have probably already looked at, keeping patients out of the hospital, using home visits to uh, prevent an ER visit as an example as well. So kind of beyond the scope of this, I think the way that we've looked at that is to get to uh, the situation of, of capitation, we've got to make sure that we're avoiding um, sort of inappropriate utilization based on either patient factors or disease factors, um, reaching out to patients in their home where we can, using technology where we can um, to try to make that sort of the right uh, level of care for those folks. We're not quite in that area yet, so I don't know how helpful that is, but one way that we would sort of, if we were given a capitated rate and said take care of these folks, our first process would be to focus on identifying where resources are being utilized that we might be able to make an impact on. Okay, thanks. I mean, I, I think you're right. Quality measures and keeping people out of the hospital is where to start. I'm just, you know, concerned that it's going to be tough to to do that. And for people who are heavy care users, people with Parkinson's or MS or ALS, they need more and more care. And so it's, it's challenging. I mean, again, uh, there could be a whole other discussion. We're happy to, to talk offline about it. But you know, things that we're using that you may have as well. We, we have care managers in the practice that reach out to those highest risk patients. We identify those folks through our claims data. We have multiple people involved on their care team. We see them a lot in the office. Um, we utilize, uh, we, we do a home visit program, post-hospital discharge for at-risk patients. And there's a lot of work going on in that area, but you're right, it is challenging. And especially if the, if the payment for those high complexity patients is not equal to the cost, it becomes obviously quite challenging. Um, I don't have an easy solution to that other than that we're focusing on kind of complex care management for those at-risk folks in a variety of outreach ways. Okay, thank you. Sure. Great. Well, this was phenomenal. Thank you very much. Um, we did have one other question from Allison about where the recording and the slides will be posted. Uh, they will definitely be posted on the Connecticut Health Policy Project website um, and possibly on the MAPOC site. 
Um, but I will send an email out to everyone to let them know. But I want to thank uh, Drs. Hines and Nasser very, very much, and so um, if, thank you all. If, um, oh, you're welcome. If, if there were any more questions, I mean, I'm, I'm not in a huge – my next thing isn't until 1, so if, if I'm happy to stay for another 5 minutes, 10 minutes. If there are other questions, I'm happy to wrap it up now, too. I'm not sure if, um, what everybody else's schedule is. Like. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions, and you okay. helpfully gave us, uh, you'll be sorry you did this, but you helpfully gave us your email address. <laughs> so you, um, yeah, no, and, I wouldn't and worry Dr. about Dr. it. Dr. Nasser's um, email address is uh, just is J Nasser, N A S S E R, um, at crystalrunhealthcare.com as well. Great. Thank you very much. No problem. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks.